welcome you all to The Gateway. The Gateway is a video podcast directed and hosted by staff members of Somerset Community College's student newspaper, The Bridge. This is The Gateway. Hello, SEC, and welcome to this spring semester season premiere of The Gateway. We hope you've had a safe and wonderful winter break, and I hope you're thriving well enough this semester so far. I'm your host, Eli Parker. I'm Miguel Santabria. And I'm Eric Woldridge. Yes, sir. We're going to be a lot more technical on this episode today as we have the program coordinator for the digital, is it printing or technology? I'm it, has a lot of, it has a lot of terms. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> we uh, we re- really refer to it as 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing. There Although we the go. books, I think, call it digital printing, but, you know. That's the best we could do. Yeah, I've heard 3D printing the most, so... It is the most accurate term for the for what we do in the lab. Oh, yeah, and it's a popular term, too. So, just going into it, uh, describe to us the both the program and just the field itself of 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Sure. Well, it, it's big. It is really, really big. Um, the 3D printing world and additive manufacturing is present in everything. Everything from your biomedical all the way up to your construction printing. We were actually seeing houses uh, being moved and printed on a regular basis. Mm. We're seeing biomedical parts. We're seeing uh, culinary. We actually got one of our lab techs doing a uh, 3D printing project where she's actually printing chocolate Ooh. and uh, developing a new type of, of shaping for food and some customizations. So it, anyone can use it and it can be used in any field is what we're trying to help folks understand. Now the main push and what we're really after with the technology is the fact that Kentucky is an aerospace state. We actually make our money off of making aerospace products, products for the DOD, products for the Army. Ooh. That's where Kentucky's income comes from. And those are industries that are heavily interested in being able to 3D print products. And it makes sense, too. You know, if you're in the Army, if you're in the theater of battle, you don't have three weeks to get a product to you. They want to be able to print on demand. Mm-hmm. The same thing with the aerospace industry. It's not like a high-volume industry. So we need a lower number, but especially complex and lightweight products, which is why 3D printing is so interesting to them. So whoever has the workforce that can do 3D printing will be the state that gets the contracts. So there's our primary mandate from the funding sources, from the NSF, from the USDA, is that we get 3D printing technology into Kentucky's workforce as quickly as possible. Oh, dang. So is there like a ranking as like Kentucky and the states for that? Well, we're pretty proud. We were the first state in the nation to actually have a statewide 3D printing certificate program. Uh, We actually had that before anyone else. And really, we're, you know, there's some colleges that have it here and there, Mm -hmm. but we were the first to actually do it in a broad spectrum sense. So that's a, a highlight for us to say that we were the first out the gate to make it, to have such a statewide push Mm -hmm. for this work. Well, that's awesome. Um, so how did you yourself get into the field? <laughs> so uh, my background, I'm in uh, engineering. Um, I'm a professional engineer, and I primarily come from the design world of mechanical manufacturing and architectural. Mm-hmm. So I've designed buildings, I've designed prototypes, patents, those kind of things. And what happened on the year of 2013 and uh, right around Thanksgiving weekend we unboxed our first desktop 3D printer and a low-cost model, one that was really accessible. And we printed our first thing, a Batarang, was the first (laughs) thing we ever made. As it should be. As it should be. It makes total sense. And uh, the moment that happened, the moment that we had something produced from a digital product that had no waste material, it was just exactly what we just wanted, didn't have any hazard materials, didn't have to worry about any lubricants, didn't have any uh, cleanup to worry about. Just that project was right there. We knew this was a game changer. Mm -hmm. So from that moment, that's when we started creating the program to lead Kentucky in this direction, Mm -hmm. to be able to take the technology and make it accessible. At that point in time, there were 3D printers, but these were expensive industrial Mm -hmm. units. These were things that universities had, Louisville, UK, I mean, they all had them. But no one gets to play with stuff like that. You don't get to toy around with something that's worth uh, $75,000. But now, with desktop models, this was a completely new thought process. So we had to reinvent how this was going to be taught 
and the type of folks that were going to use it. And uh, it, it, we had some trial and error. We had mm-hmm. some learning curves with that, too. And then the NSF, National Science Foundation, the ATE program specifically, came alongside us and provided us the first uh, seed funding mm-hmm. to create the program, build up our lab. And uh, from then, uh, we have expanded into multi-million dollar grants and um, have you know, basically put our program all across the state. In fact, right now, we are working on putting it into the high schools as part of the KED uh, pathway process. Ooh. So it'll be available for dual credit all across the state of Kentucky. So they would come like to just their local college or just any college, for instance, to do this program? As part of uh, what's known as Advanced Kentucky, we're mm-hmm. actually training uh, high school and other college teachers mm-hmm. right now Ooh. to deliver this course in a dual credit format. So we're building the infrastructure of education mm-hmm. to make it easy for all of these students across the state to take it. Now, we actually make all the curriculum ourselves, and then each every site gets to use that curriculum so that everyone's on the same page. And here's the beauty of it, too. Education is always sort of uh, knocked because it's years behind of what industry's doing, what technology's doing. So we built this program so that is not the case. So. In the event that something exciting happens, some new piece of technology becomes available, I can instantly add that to the statewide curriculum program that day. Dang. And make it happen for students. And uh, for example, MIT just came out with a new type of material. They just announced it, that they've been able to create a new type of material that is stronger than steel, but as light as plastic. And you just think about the applications that you can do with that kind of material, especially if it's 3D printable. So that's the kind of thing that we watch for and we prepare people for, because as that material gets commercialized, it's gonna revolutionize how we look at everything. Something as strong, six times the strength of bulletproof glass that could be used as a plastic. Crazy opportunities that we can turn this into. Oh, definitely, mm-hmm. Ooh, a lot of fields there. Cause I was going through like the website to see what it was, like what it could be apple- applied to. And I saw culinary arts, that's what really shocked me. Sure. So. You've told us kind of like what 3D printing is, but can you explain like the process? Because some, sure. like including myself, and do you like know the technicalities of 3D printing? And no, <laughs> no <laughs> but he's been to the lab enough times. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so and probably gonna take a class for too long. Absolutely. <laughs> there right. you go. He's converted. <laughs> Everyone, join up. <laughs> so I had a buddy that got his certificate through you all, and mm-hmm. that was he likes that. He's good with it too. Oh yeah, there's there's so many opportunities for small business. Mm-hmm. You can turn around and create your own spinoff company mm-hmm. just because any idea that you have can be produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I brought you all some gifts. Of oh course. yes, thank You're you very much. Boxes. Uh, these were made in the lab actually <laughs> uh, yesterday, and uh, Stephen made those for us. The, uh, the key thing with this technology mm-hmm. is you have this iris box, mm-hmm. and you notice that when you turn it, it opens and closes, right? Yes, sir. But no one ever assembled these parts. Oh. This prints just like you see it right now. So the designer designed the inside sleeves, the rotating components, and the whole thing prints in one shot. Dang. So think about that from a manufacturing perspective. No assembly required, and yet you have moving parts inside something else. Dang. So that's the logic. of Now, how it works is, is fairly straightforward in some ways. You have a computer program, a mm-hmm. CAD package, mm-hmm. Fusion, um, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, uh, ProE. They're all essentially capable of creating a 3D model, even Blender, which is heavily used in the video game and animation sector. So you model something in 3D. So this designer, he actually designed this iris box on a computer in 3D. Then he takes that CAD model to another program we refer to as a slicer, and the slicer looks at the CAD model, and it says, okay, to make this, I'm gonna write a computer code to tell us the 3D printer how to make this for us. And so the designer is really done at that point in time. Once they hand it off to the slicer, the slicer writes all the code, and it makes the machine make this product. Now, the difference is between this and any other type of technology is that it, crea- it requires a different mindset. It requires folks to think differently about how something can be made because it's very easy for us to 3D model a block, like mm-hmm. a Lego. You know, that makes sense. It's easy to manufacture and everything. This stuff, this works better the more complex and organic it is. Mm-hmm. So we actually design products that look more like they are bone or organically grown from a plant, even though they might be made out of steel. 
So it's a completely different mindset. So we spend a lot of our time focusing on training people to design for it. And then at the end of the program, we teach them how to deal with the hardware. Mm -hmm. So they're learning about the process. They're learning about printing. They're actually printing in their first semester. But it's more about mentality mm -hmm. because the equipment gets better and better every six months. I mean, there's some new feature. There's a new accessibility. And a lot of the stuff that we're doing is bought off Amazon. So it's unlimited in terms of the hardware and equipment, but you have to think a different way. Okay. So that's kind of how it works. And you can also visualize, of course, you can always YouTube and Google 3D printing time lapse, and you'll see how it works. But you can also visualize it like taking a glue gun. And if you actually take a glue gun and you just keep making a circle, mm -hmm. eventually you're going to make a cylinder, right? You're just laying down a layer of glue at a time. That's exactly how 3D printing works. It lays down one layer of material at a time, whether that material is chocolate or pancakes, mm -hmm. better. If it's plastics or metal, that's how it puts it down, and then it builds the object up. Very similar cool. to actually like how plants grow. So for students, and uh, I'm curious, so for students who are interested in the program, mm -hmm. what are some of the prerequisites that, that they would need for the program? Sure. Um, so we made this program specifically for everyone. There are virtually no real prerequisites, so anyone can take it. The only thing that we kind of lean toward is you have at least a moderate amount of computer skill, meaning that you can check your email, that you know how to turn a computer on, uh, that you can do a little Googling. If you are at that level, we can take it from there and teach you everything that you need to know. We, we generally assume that everyone is at ground zero when they take our courses. Dang. What degrees are offered through the program? Sure. So we actually set it just at a certificate level hmm. because 3D printing and additive manufacturing is not a program unto itself. It is a value added. For example, we don't want 3D printer folks just to go out and get a job in doing 3D printing. We want them to go out and get a job doing culinary arts. We want them to go out and do a job in the medical field. We want them going into dentist offices. We want them going to small businesses and the classroom and taking 3D printing with them to enhance the job that they're going to primarily do. So we have welders who go out with 3D printing, industrial maintenance. Uh, the Kentucky Fame program is incorporating 3D printing into their track. And of course, our engineers, our business folks, our art department, those are the folks we want to be able to use the technology. And it's open to not only any cultural background is also open to any gender. It's something that everyone can do, and we're finding that out is that everyone loves being able to do this. Jewelry makers, pottery, it's all there. Dang, that is awesome. There's just the range of that. It can be almost used in, like you said, everything pretty much. Mm -hmm. And going back, you caught my attention with the whole, this was all assembled in one piece. Right. So The, the printer did the, all the work itself. The, this whole thing just printed one go from t uh, bottom to top. Yep. So I don't know if this is a, something that's starting now, but could you, this be ideally used to, like, make whole, like, machines and, like, cars? The idea is there. And obviously the more complex, the more you have to spend on the design yeah. side. But, uh, yes, that is the goal, is not only can we make moving parts inside other objects, but we can embed different materials at it, as it prints. So self-relubricating plastics can be added in. Um, you could actually drop in components as it's printing. For example, in the lab, we have embedded magnets within objects. We have embedded circuitry. Uh, and the technology is growing where we can actually print with conductive plastics, magnetic plastics, and all sorts of uh, very exotic materials all with the same device. So not only can we make parts inside parts, we can make those parts out of different materials, potentially conductive materials, which allows for sensing, which allows for you know transfer of power, uh, even the potential for generating power is in this. Uh, another example is we actually have a mesh setup where we actually use the printers to generate a very thin layered mesh. So I can take that exact same plastic and I can turn it into a fabric. And we actually have that in the lab too. Uh, one of the fabrics specifically is an antiviral. So we actually have an antiviral mesh that will kill COVID Ooh. on contact uh, and antibacterial. So it's... It's a story of mentality. It's a story of exotic materials we've never been able to do things with. And it's a story about creativity. Your ability to say, you know what, I want to turn this into a business, or I want to turn this into a new product. And you have to sit back and think, what all could I do? And the printers will be like, okay, we'll do it for you. 
just tell us how. So what, what impact do you think this would have on the, I'm thinking about like waste, mm, mm-hmm. you know, industry, like all these, so, you know, just in, speak to that. If you sure. Can. So we're dealing with plastics. We're dealing with, and we can deal with metals too, but plastics are one of the primary ways that people get into this, this world. It's plastic. It's plastic that can come from recycled plastic. We can actually take milk jugs, grind them down, and turn them back into material we can print with. Uh, we can actually take seaweed and turn it into a plastic. In fact, actually, this right here is a cornstarch-based plastic. So the biogradable ability is very high, and uh, the compostability is very high. But more than that, we can start looking at a more sustainable environment where we're taking our waste and turning it into products. Uh, We have been approached by several different industries that have waste that they want to uh, retask, if you will, uh, from both the bourbon industry and the uh, agricultural market. There's a lot of bio-waste that they want to turn back into product. Mm. So we're working with them in actually doing that. Uh, I went to Egypt over uh, over the spring last May with the intent of taking 3D printing to regions that are impoverished. And also, they make a living by recycling trash. They literally go out and collect trash and then sort it and then resell it. The idea is to allow them to have the ability to turn their trash into products. Not just sell the trash but convert the trash into something that is a marketable product. Kind of like created. trash into cash, if you will. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's, a, it's a circular economy, and a circular material economy especially. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very, very uh, ideal as we approach these days when our petroleum supplies are declining. You know, our petroleum needs to be for plastic. And this is a way that we can start diverting those product streams away from petroleum into products made from things that we can grow and recycle. Well, dang. Absolutely. Well, man's trash is definitely another man's treasure. Or that's that's absolutely right. right. You know, just takes a little bit of creativity, a little bit of thought. We've actually helped some small businesses spin off just with one printer. Oh. Uh, there's a great, I'll put a plug in for Walleye Solutions. They actually sell off Amazon, and uh, they they 3D print a great product that they had in mind but the manufacturing cost for any type of new prototype is usually in the, the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So as part with a USDA rural development program opportunity, we actually help them get started and get their first printer and get going with their first product. Now they're up to, I think, 20 or maybe more 3D printers making product uh, for their business. Oh, that's awesome. And there's lots of companies out there that people don't realize that are actually doing this same business model. And it's a great way to get started. Mm-hmm. An investment right there. And so something I discovered that you started up last year, um, the Rapid Response Additive Manufacturing Initiative. Did I remember that correctly? That is correct. Yes. You got, that, you got the acronym just yes, right. Perfect. The RAMI. There we go. RAMI. Okay, I was wondering <laughs> if that's how it's pronounced. So you started that up really early last year. It's almost up to its, like, anniversary or past its anniversary. It is. It? We actually would be hitting uh, our, our first anniversary test would have been February 1st. And uh, what the Ramey system was, was, I guess you could say, the world's first statewide additive manufacturing response network. Mm-hmm. So through funding, federal funding, we were able to essentially establish 3D print sites across KCCS colleges. Uh, you can also refer to them as 3D print farms. Mm-hmm. And train folks to produce on demand. And what was really interesting about this project is that it happened right in the middle of COVID, which meant that we could not do face-to-face training. Mm. So the challenge was, here we had all of these resources. The challenge was, how are we going to train these people who've never touched one of these devices before to not only put these devices together, but operate them without ever actually getting to see them or, or touch the equipment with them? And so we developed an online process, a remote training process, and so we never, we never met face-to-face. We actually shipped all the equipment to them in the box. Mm. They assembled. They got it dialed in. And on February 1st, in our very first inaugural test run, our maiden voyage, we had the entire state system operational in 30 minutes. Nice. And wow. in, in the first 32 hours, I think we produced about 1,700 face shields oh my uh, across that. There so it was, uh, it was an exciting awesome. moment. It actually went better than we thought it would, to be perfectly honest <laughs> with you. Uh, we only actually had one dud out of the entire group. And so now uh, our second run was in May, and we produced uh, – we actually did the, um, 
the Generation 1 nasal swabs that mm. were first introduced during COVID. Uh, we actually did, I think, around six or 7,000 of those in under 32 hours that, through oh that same gosh. network. So the idea is these sites can be using the technology to educate, to train, but at the same time, in the event of emergency or an opportunity, they can immediately turn the system on and the entire process can be repeated. So I just designed one file and I sent everybody and suddenly we have hundreds of parts overnight. Awesome. Awesome. We're speaking about a lot of different industries. Um, is there any humanitarian mm. um, things that you Absolutely. Uh, so there's a, there a whole host of them. Uh, you see these being taken to third world countries, uh, war savage countries, mm -hmm. and they're doing uh, biomedical tools. Uh, everything from amputee arms all the way up to uh, splints, um, you know, braces, things that you just can't get. Uh, another thing that I learned, too, when I was dealing with some of this in the Egypt project is that, you know, in the States, we take a lot of things for granted. If I need a hinge or I need a bike part or if I need a bolt... I can go to the hardware store and I can go get that. Mm -hmm. So to us, 3D printing, that doesn't seem logical. Mm -hmm. But you go to somewhere where there is no hardware store, when that bike is your only source of transportation to your job, when your door won't stay up because you have no hinge, and your only solution is to try to carve something out of a tree bark, a 3D printer means a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And so the use of the 3D printing technology in these areas that have no access to materials and manufacturing is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And so the more folks that we train in how to use the technology, both at the student level and the professional level, and even the, the foreign aid worker level, the more we can you know, basically solve problems and potentially save lives in many of these cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the fact that you have children now who can have 3D printed arms for and hands for like less than 100 bucks, when a prosthesis usually costs about $10,000. So completely awake of thinking. And some of the products that you already have, like your Invisalign braces, those will use 3D printing to make those happen. Smile Direct Club, 3D printing. Uh, a lot of the new shoes that are coming that have this really, really complex uh, soles and heels to them, that's 3D printed. Mm. Uh, so there's so many things that are available on the market that we can replicate both here and in uh, impoverished areas. Well, definitely. I think that could be applied here, too. Like, it co-aligns kind of with the right to repair. Because, mm -hmm. like you said, United States, we take it for granted. Like, if, say, our phone breaks, we just throw it out and get a new one. But right. it sounds like 3D printing could be used to potentially, like, repair your own parts for it. Absolutely. Which is why, you know, the military wants it's, it has such an interest in this. Mm -hmm. You know, on-site production, on-carrier on production. You know, when you're out at sea, you don't have a supply chain system. And if I just have raw stock material sitting on a shelf that I can be converted into a bracket that holds this or a critical bearing that holds that or maybe even a specific gear that keeps the machine going, you know, that's what I want. I don't want to have to stockpile every single part four or five times when I can just stockpile one material block and turn that into whatever I want. Mm -hmm. So on the humanitarian side, the military side, even the industrial side, this is a technology. We were on the uh, call yesterday with a group, actually it's a major manufacturer here in our region, and we were talking about it, and they said, we had ha helped them in the early stages. I didn't realize they had, had grown to this level, but he said, yeah, we have 10 3D printers running 24 seven, making products, he said, and we depend on them. He wow. said, they are basically, we, you know, keeping our operations and our maintenance guys going so and that's just a bank of printers just producing whatever they need wow Dang. Uh, i got one last question from my end sure. um what's your vision for the program here mm. as you see so we have a lot of visions uh for sure sure-term. because the the, the, the <laughs> technology is in increasing um so one for sure that is the 3d printing of buildings so uh you know in my my background and my professional world is engineering and architecture. I, mean, I want to print buildings. That's huge. I want to get that in. I want to get that through our permitting process with our building code. We want to see people printing buildings, not just because of a reduction in cost, but because these will be buildings printed out of concrete. They can be of custom shape, custom size, uh, perform better in high winds, which we've seen obviously is an issue in Kentucky. We can actually design structures that are much more, I shouldn't say the word resistant, but allow wind to flow around them much easier. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you don't get the uplift, the high stress points near corners. 
potentially buy a printing building. So that's where we want to be mm -hmm. as a society, as a college, as a program. The other application of all this is just the use of it and everything from what we physically produce to virtual reality, which is a spinoff that we are currently working on yes. now um, it, with the, another NSF grant that is allowing us to take low-cost additive, additive in 3D printing, and use that same concept to get into low-cost VR where people can start creating VR programs and applications that tie in with additive and tie in with their own world much more effectively. Because the technology, you know, the, the Quest 2 is out there, 3D printers are out there. The ability to make both digital and physical is right at our fingertips. I mean, look at the fact that we have, you know, we have things that don't exist being turned into digital tokens, right? People are literally buying <laughs> digital <laughs> land that does not exist in reality, mm -hmm. and they're paying money for this. Yes, yes. Why aren't we getting our students and our workforce mm -hmm. into that market? Talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what we're awesome. after, too. Awesome. The physical object, because it's all about design. Mm -hmm. You know, if I 3D print this, that's awesome. But I can take that same file that 3D printed it and turn it into a virtual reality file that I could do something with and make it a smart object in the virtual realm too. Whoa. It's all connected. So that's where we want to grow all of this. In design, production and 3D printing, houses, new materials, but also the virtual world needs to reflect this as much. Oh, definitely. If you are to reach this goal, do you have an estimated like amount of years this would take to reach this? Oh, well, let's see. We sh we're shooting for, uh, we're actually already in the process for getting a concrete printer system so Ooh. we were already put in for it and everything so sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right grant at the right time mm -hmm. so i would say let our target is less than three years we want to be operational with production on uh, construction the other side of it though like the vr we're doing it right now our first grant has already proven that i can take someone who knows nothing about vr and I can train them in not only the CAD modeling, but the programming and create some simple VR applications. We're doing some of our beta testers right now. We're going to grow that program. And so we're looking that maybe two or three years, we actually are starting to create our own VR educational packages Whoa. and VR environments to sell our products. Nice. You got to think nice. about the fact, every, nice. you know, all these Quest 2s that are being sold to kids on Christmas, that is a brand new marketing platform mm. because the parents are going to put those things on. And then they're going to figure out they can start to shop that way. Mm. And then they're going to figure out that they can experience a product in a VR realm, that they can actually start to learn things in the VR space. That's going to change the dynamic. So we're going to turn into Ready Player One. with That's exactly this. right. That's exactly right. So next time we can sit around in a virtual booth there we and go. Uh, we can have these that. conversations. Yep. And, yep. Uh, you know, we can actually you know, play on some virtual guitars. It'd be great. Yeah, and, yeah. like, we could have just different avatars. Like, I'll be a giant gorilla. Why not? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of imagination. And the realization that it's, it's not rocket science. I think we have a, a tendency as a society, especially nowadays, to fear... Uh, what seems complicated. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that with 3D printing. We see that with VR. The fact is, it's not like you can break it. I can design anything all day long and not get it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I can always undo and do it again. So we have to break through that fear factor mm -hmm. and help people realize that anybody can do 3D printing. Anybody can do VR. And, and we can show you the tools to do it. Awesome. That is awesome. awesome. So when it's said and done, overall, just if th these fields, virtual reality, 3D printing, the big statement is there's a lot of potential with it. Oh, it's unlimited. And whoever does it first is the is the winner. So whoever gets out there and has the workforce that can take advantage of this. And that is our goal for Kentucky, that mm -hmm. our students and our people have this skill before anybody else in a large mass quantity, mm -hmm. meaning that it opens the door to create new innovation. Access always breeds innovation. And so our focus has been low cost, low cost, low cost. Because if I have low cost, then I have easy access. I couldn't think of a better note to end that on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Say we've reached in our time, so we're going to wrap up here. Just mm -hmm. want to thank you again very much for coming pleasure, here with us. Pleasure, pleasure indeed. Yes. And real quick, I just want to thank all of you, the viewers, and w our wonderful guests like Mr. Eric Wooldridge here, as well as the whole br uh, the bridge and gateway staff for allowing us to uh, place first with the KPA for this podcast. Thank you all very much. Congratulations. Thank you, yes, Thank you very much. Indeed. We hope to provide a, way, a lot more great things this semester and just going on for us. So mm -hmm. thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your semester. Thank you all.
for more information on SEC Student Newspaper, The Bridge, or the Gateway Video Podcast, email us at secthebridge at yahoo.com or contact one of the course advisors. This is The Gateway, signing out.